Well, from the rising of the sun to the place where it sets, as the psalmist declares, the name of the Lord is to be praised. Before we spend some time together in the Word, we're going to spend a few moments together in prayer, and I'm really excited about this particular time of prayer. I've asked three of our shepherding couples here at the branch to pray over all of us. Over the last several weeks, we've been praying over a lot of different themes related to what we're walking through, both in the life of our church as well as in the world around us. But I thought it would be really powerful to have some of our own elders and their wives pray over us right now. And I've asked them to cover three particular themes for us. Chris and Kristen Brewer are going to pray over all of us as it relates to our mental and emotional health and well-being. Then Terry and Janet Grimm are going to pray over us in regard to our financial and vocational well-being. And finally, you'll hear Jason and Kimberly Schumacher as they'll pray over us in regard to our physical health and well-being. I want to encourage you right where you are just to go ahead and open up your palms to the Lord right there in your lap and soak in these prayers over us. Let's pray together. Father, we are reminded of who you are. I am grateful that you are over all things, big and small. Your power, your love, your grace leaves me in awe. Right now, I want to pray for those who are weary, who are lonely, who are anxious, who might be struggling. I ask that you help us to meditate on your goodness and your faithfulness. And I pray that you fill us with a peace that is constant through all the ups and downs we face each day. Give us the courage and humility to be vulnerable and reaching out for prayer and encouragement from others. Lord, I pray you surround us with others who will remind us where our help comes from and to lift our gaze away from the troubles of this world and straight to you, the one who provides the hope we need in this season and in all seasons. We have so much to be thankful for, especially to know that we can cast all of our anxiety on you because you care for us. I'm also thankful for your word from Isaiah where you tell us, do not fear for I am with you. Do not anxiously look about you, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Surely I will help you. Surely I will uphold you with my righteous right hands. Heavenly Father, you are the one, Lord, the one who delivers, the one who provides, the one who keeps his promises, the one who works miracles. We ask you now, Lord, to provide for all who are affected financially by this period of sheltering in place. We ask you to provide freedom from fear. We ask you to provide opportunities. Your word says in Ephesians 3.20 that you're able to do immeasurably more than all we can ask or imagine. Thank you for this promise, Lord, and help us to believe this promise. And Lord, we thank you for what you're going to do, for old jobs restored, for new jobs, for new positions, for more than we can ask or imagine. Father God, thank you for your promise to hear our prayers. Lord, your word tells us in Isaiah 41 10 to not fear because you're with us. You hold us up with your righteous right arm. We know it is not your will for us to be afraid. Lord, we lift up those of us who have lost jobs, who have lost income, to be free from fear. Lord, we ask your Holy Spirit to fill us with power to resist Satan's attack of fear. Father, we also know that you are the provider. You told Abraham when you provided a ram to sacrifice in place of Isaac, that one of your names is Jehovah Jireh, the Lord will provide. So we ask for the blessings of Jehovah Jireh to provide jobs and financial blessings for all those struggling. Lord, let them feel your presence. Rain down your provision on them. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. 3 John chapter 1, verse 2. Beloved, I pray that all may go well with you and that you may be in good health as it goes well with your soul. Psalm 103 of David. Praise the Lord my soul. All my inmost being, praise his holy name. Praise the Lord my soul and forget not all his benefits who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion, who satisfies your desires with good things 
so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. Pray with me. Holy God, we're so glad that you love us, so glad that you know us, and Lord, you know how many hairs we have on our head, and we're so grateful that you are our Creator and Father. Lord, we pray protection over our bodies and our physical health in the midst of this time. Lord, give us wisdom about what we're supposed to do and how we're supposed to do it. Lord, we're so grateful for doctors and nurses and so many that are working so hard to restore our bodies. And Lord, we pray that you restore them as they continue to expend that energy. And Lord God, we pray for anybody who is sick right now, whether with this dreaded virus or some other disease. Lord God, we pray that you heal them in the name of Jesus. It's in Jesus' holy and mighty name we pray. Amen. And now to you who is able to do immeasurably more than all we can ask or imagine, according to your power at work within us, to you be glory in Christ Jesus and in this church, both now and forevermore. And in the name of Jesus, the church says, amen. I've got a good buddy out in San Diego who posted this on his Instagram account this past week, and his sentiments are my sentiments exactly. The most useless purchase of 2019, a 2020 planner. I've learned so many things these past several weeks, one of which is this, the things that I count on happening in the future, I shouldn't necessarily take for granted. I need to hold on to them loosely even while I hold on to the hand of Jesus as tight as I can. So we're spending some time with the writings of the Apostle Paul and even in a few stories of the Apostle Paul right now because Paul can teach us something about what it is to live certain on the promises of God in the midst of uncertain times. We were in Philippians 1 last week. We returned to Philippians chapter 1 this week. And we saw last week that while we don't have much control over certain outcomes, we do have a choice when it comes to a certain outlook. The Apostle Paul taught us last week that even though he's in chains, he was completely preoccupied with being in Christ. And for Paul, he was in Christ before he was even in chains, and that shaped how he looked at everything around him. He looked at everything around him through Christ. This past week, I was struck by a mother who was reflecting on an experience where she had been reading the Chronicles of Narnia, C.S. Lewis's great work to her children. And recently, one of her seven-year-olds said to her one evening about that story, Mama, Please read to me about Aslan. Aslan is the name of the great lion in the Chronicles of Narnia. Aslan represents Jesus. She says, Mama, please read to me about Aslan tonight. She said, Why, baby? And her daughter responded, Because when you read about Aslan, I don't think as much about my fears out of the mouths of babes. That young girl is learning about the power of being preoccupied with Jesus. And this is Paul. He's preoccupied with Jesus and with what it is to be in Christ. And because he saw himself in Christ, he saw everything that happened around him through Christ. He's dealing with an unjust imprisonment. He's dealing with an unfair portrayal of himself by what other people are saying around him. And he's also dealing with living with certain uncertainties about the future ahead. We're going to pick up with what Paul has to say about this in Philippians 1 and verse 18 and how he's dealing with all this. And so to get us rolling, one of my heroes in the faith, Ed Bonneau, is going to read Philippians 1, 18 through 1, 26. Listen now to the reading of the word. Yes, and I will continue to rejoice. For I know that through your prayers and the help given by the Spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage so that now, as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. If I'm to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Yet what shall I choose? I do not know. I'm torn between the two. 
I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is, by, which is better by far. But it's more necessary for you that I remain in the body. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and I will continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith. So that through my being with you again, your joy in Christ will, will overflow on account of me. Now, one of the things that's so striking to me about what Paul writes here is when he talks about his expectation or his hope in verse 20. His expectation and hope, it doesn't seem to have anything to do with whether or not he gets out of house arrest or even whether or not he lives. He doesn't even bring that up. Rather, when he talks about his expectation and his hope, it's all tied to whether or not he's going to have courage. Look again at verse 20. Paul says, I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage so that now as always, Christ will be exalted in my body by life or by death. Paul's completely preoccupied. His primary concern is with whether or not he's going to have the courage to exalt Jesus in his life or in his death. And you know, exalting Christ at some point in uncertain times is going to require some courage. I think it's kind of cool. Paul does mention where he thinks his sufficient courage is going to come from. If you look up one verse earlier to verse 19, I see three places that Paul sees his courage is coming from. Check it out. He says in verse 19, he mentions the prayer of others. For I know that through your prayers... And then he mentions uh, God's provision of his Holy Spirit. He says, and God's provision of the Spirit. And then finally, he mentions his perspective. He says, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. Paul's courage comes from three different sources. He mentions the prayers of the Philippians, the indwelling or empowerment of the Holy Spirit. And then he does bring up his perspective. His perspective brings, his, brings him courage. He says, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. Now, here's what's interesting. Paul is certain about his deliverance. He's uncertain as to what his deliverance is going to look like. He brings up a couple of different scenarios in the course of this reading. Either he's going to be delivered through eventually being allowed to live by Rome and when Rome allows him to live, he just sees that as, hey, that's deliverance. It's going to mean fruitful, continued labor for me on behalf of Christ on this side of the grave. But then Paul also can see his deliverance is actually coming through his death at the hands of Rome. Because if he's executed by Rome, then that means that he's going to go and be with Jesus for good. Paul has this outlook that either outcome can be a platform for Jesus to be glorified. And that's why he talks about Jesus being exalted, either by his life or by his death. For Paul, this thing is a win-win for Jesus. But it's also a win-win for him. Jesus is going to be glorified in both outcomes in his life, as far as he's concerned, by how he conducts himself in his life or in his death. But he thinks it's a win-win for him. He goes on to say this in verse 21. For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. If I'm to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Yet what shall I choose? I'm torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far, but it's more necessary for you that I remain in the body. And I read that and I want to go, is this some kind of attitude or what? Here's a guy who's under house arrest awaiting the biggest trial of his life. And all he can say is, hey, I've got some incredible options here, either I, I can't lose because to live is Christ, to die is gain. Either I'm going to be freed here and I'll continue being fruitful in my labor for Christ, this side of the grave, or I'm going to die and I'll just go ahead and go and depart and be with Christ. And the point is, Paul's not burning much of his energy agonizing over certain outcomes in his life. He's focused on exalting Jesus in whatever outcome, and his imagination is even dedicated toward how could Jesus be glorified in this outcome? How could Jesus be glorified in that outcome? I gotta tell you what, 
Paul's outlook completely challenges me, particularly that line, to live is Christ. That's so challenging to me because I'll level with you. I have a lot of days in my life where that's not my motto. My motto that I'm living by isn't to live is Christ. My motto that I'm living by is this, to live is me. And I think, quite honestly, most of us as human beings really struggle to live as Christ, that it's real easy to get sucked into the narrative of to live is me. But I want to tell you what, if you and I are living by the motto to live is me, then to die isn't gain. To die is tragic. But not only is death tragic when you and I are living by the motto to live is me, life becomes tragic as well. Because if I go through life as though all of life is all about me, I'm going to be perpetually disappointed and frustrated pretty much all of the time because the rest of the world is not going to cooperate with my agenda, nor is reality. And this is because life and this world doesn't revolve around me. God loves me, God is for me, but that doesn't mean his will or this world revolves around me. It's a completely unrealistic expectation to live as though this world revolves around me because it just doesn't. And one of the many good things that I see coming out of this time in which we are living is I think all of us have been jolted out of this motto of to live is me. Because we've been through this radical rearrangement of life, this radical rearrangement of society that's all about thinking about others and not ourselves. You know, when our boys were little, Tara and I took this class a couple of different times here at the branch called Growing Kids God's Way. Some of you may have taken it with us. And one of the most helpful and important things that we learned and we attempted to incorporate in our own life and family is this fundamental principle that our children were not the center of our family. Our children were a welcome addition to our family unit. And this affirmation was important to us for a couple of different reasons. One is it called for us to continue to give our attention to our marriage covenant because the truth is our marriage pre-existed our children and our marriage will still be here after our children leave home. But the other reason why this is important is it actually prepared our kids for life better because life in this world doesn't revolve around them. They can't always have it their way. And to raise them and parent them as though they can always have it their way is to set them up for incredible frustration and futility and emptiness in life. We're setting them up for failure if we're raising our kids to think that they can always have it their way. But here's the deal. What we want our children to understand is something that we still all too easily forget about ourselves. And so one of the things the last several weeks has done for me, it simply just reminded me that this world doesn't revolve around me. It doesn't bend to my will and that I'm called to sacrifice for the sake of others. Now, here's the deal. If you were living by the motto, to live is Christ, when you entered into the season we're in, then I'm here to tell you, you were already equipped not to have your joy and peace stolen from you. Because when you're living as Christ, your joy and peace is tied to Christ and not to your will always being realized, not to you always getting what you want when you want it. Your joy and peace come from Christ. And, and so, I mean, to live as Christ actually sets you up to be able to handle seasons as, that, like this better because your joy and peace is not always tied to you getting what you want when you want it. Your joy and peace is tied to the unchanging reality of who you are in Christ. Your joy and peace come from Christ. Every now and then, I think it's really helpful to take that phrase, to live as Christ and to die as gain, and just to, to write it down again, but to remove the word Christ and gain, to leave those blank. And I just simply want to ask you, every now and then, you ought to reflect, to live is, what would you put in the blank? And to die is, what would you put in the blank? 
See, in many ways, to follow Christ is to learn how to really live with him filling that first blank. This is what Paul has learned to do over time. And because he's learned to do it, it brought him a joy and peace that couldn't be touched or hindered by chains and house arrest. Now, here's the deal. Paul goes on and he tells them his hunch is to remain alive. But I want you to notice again what he says about exalting Christ. Going a little bit further, he says, but it's more necessary for you that I remain in the body. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and I will continue with all of you for your progress and for your joy in the faith. So that through my being with you again, your boasting in Christ Jesus will abound on account of me. Now, I want you to notice that. Did you catch what he said? He says, hey, if I'm to be with you again, then, then your boasting in Christ Jesus will abound on account of me. In other words, what he's saying is, hey, if I'm to be with you again, that means I got delivered circumstantially in a pretty incredible way. And that's going to be an opportunity for you to boast in Jesus all the more. Paul's stories were never about him being the hero so that people boast about his greatness. Paul saw his life as a story and an opportunity for people to boast about the greatness of Jesus when Jesus did something circumstantially in his life. And for Paul, he can't help but look at all of life and what's happening to him from the perspective of what could this have to do with the glory of Jesus, the will of Jesus, the agendas of Jesus, the purposes of Jesus. For Paul to live is Christ. But enough about him. Because now Paul's going to pivot and he wants to talk to the Philippians about the Philippians. So he says this in verse 27. He says this, whatever happens, conduct yourself in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Now this is powerful. Paul has been talking about himself the previous 26 verses. He's been giving them an example out of his own life of what it looks like to conduct yourself in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ, whatever happens. He's letting them know, I'm in this with you. I'm seeking to walk my talk, but now I want to talk to you about you. Whatever happens, conduct yourself in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. I want you to grab a hold of this right now. He's not saying that you conduct yourself in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ so that you'll be saved by the gospel of Christ. No, for Paul, it's we conduct ourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ because... We've been saved by the gospel of Christ. You see, we live because of Christ. Therefore, for us, to live is Christ. We live because of Christ. Therefore, to us, to live is Christ. Now, what I want you to do is I want you to lock into those words, whatever happens. Those are big words. You see, followers of Jesus aren't faithful to Jesus under a certain set of circumstances. We're faithful, whatever the circumstances. In fact, it's, it's worth noting that it's often in difficult circumstances that our conduct really begins to be noticed by others. I think this happened for Paul. Let me show you something kind of cool. Go to the very end of the letter to the Philippians, uh, the next to last verse when Paul is signing off, Philippians 4 and 22. Check out what Paul says here. He's saying this to the people in Philippi. He says, all God's people here... He's talking about in Rome, that's where he is. All God's people here send you greetings, especially those who belong to Caesar's household. Did you get a load of that? I think this is so cool. There are some in Caesar's household that are now a part of the people of God there in Rome. He says, all the people here send you greetings especially those who are a part of Caesar's household. I can't help but think this has something to do with how Paul conducted himself while he was in chains. And him closing the letter this way was his way of saying, hey, I may be chained, but the gospel isn't. I may be chained, but the spirit isn't. The word isn't. Your prayers aren't chained. I may be chained, but the message of Jesus isn't. And some of Caesar's own household now run free in Christ and are followers of Christ. And speaking of Caesar, 
You know, we've been bringing him up these last couple of weekends. Let me just go ahead and tell you the end of this story circumstantially for Paul. This Caesar's name was Nero. Between him and Paul, you couldn't find two people in more opposite situations in Rome. Nero was a Caesar. Paul was a prisoner. Nero was a hero. Paul was a zero. Nero's name was in headlines all throughout the Roman Empire. Paul wasn't so famous. Nero was one good-looking dude, a lot of people said at that time. Paul was a stoop-shouldered, hunched-over old man with a body full of scars from being stoned, being whipped within an inch of his life, being shipwrecked on three different occasions. Nero, he was a different dude. Good-looking, and he loved soft skin. You may think, what a weird thing to bring up Seedman, but let me tell you one of the craziest things about Nero. Nero had 400 donkeys in his royal stable. Why, you ask? Because Nero liked for all of his wives to bathe in donkey milk because it was Nero's conviction that donkey milk did the best of anything at evoking the silky smoothness of skin that he wanted to touch in his wives so he made his wives bathe in donkey milk. <laughs> but what Nero wanted, Nero got. Paul, he was a single man. He wasn't married, spending most of his life in prison. He rarely got what he wanted. If you asked anyone in Rome who would have the greater influence on the world at this time, it would be Nero, and most everybody would agree with this. Nero deified himself at the age of 25. He had a 120-foot statue built for him in the center of Rome. Nero had all the freedom, all the power, all the circumstances the world could ask for. Paul's so limited in so many ways. And yet by the age of 29, Nero was lonely and paranoid. His second wife killed his first wife. And then Nero, shortly after that, kicked his second wife to death while she was pregnant with their child. The story only gets worse. Nero wound up taking his own life only four years after Paul was executed in the Roman Empire. Today, there are no cathedrals named after Nero. Today, the name Nero adorns pizza places and pets. But Paul? Huh. We name cathedrals after him. Paul? We name children after him. There are boys named Paul and girls named Paulina all over this world. Today, the things that Nero wrote, you can hardly find. But Paul? What he wrote while under house arrest and in prison formed almost half the content of our New Testaments. It makes up a chunk of our Bible that is the most widely read and widely published book in the history of the world. You say, Chris, what are you saying? I'm saying this. When you're living in Christ, you're not near as limited as you think. So whatever happens, conduct yourself in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. So what does that look like? I want to close by showing you three uh, quick ways this looks, particularly in a world of uncertain circumstances. And to do that, I just want to show it right out of the book of Philippians, uh, really a brief outline of the rest of Philippians. Here we go. Three ways we conduct ourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel, whatever the circumstances. The first is this, whatever happens, we look to Jesus as our example. That's Philippians 2. In fact, if you just look at the excerpts of Philippians 2, 3 through 8, Paul writes, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interest, but each of you to the interest of others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ. Check that out. He's calling them and us to think like Jesus. Have the same mindset as Christ, who made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant. He humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. You know what? In uncertain times, it's so easy to put the focus on ourselves. To live is me. And yet whatever happens, we must continue to follow the pattern of Jesus who thought of the interest of others even above his own. And you know what? Practically speaking, I have so often found that my joy increases in times of uncertainty when I decrease and put my focus on others. It's when my focus is on me that my joy 
decreases. Here's a second way we conduct ourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel. Whatever happens, whatever happens, we make Jesus our pursuit. That's Philippians 3. Paul is obsessed with pursuing the one who's pursued him, even in his circumstances. So he writes this in Philippians 3, 10 through 14. I want to know Christ, yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings. I want to become like him in his death uh, and, and, and attaining the resurrection from the dead. Not that I've already obtained all this or have already arrived at my goal. He's still in process. But I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead. I press on. This is Paul. He's continuing to pursue Jesus wherever he is, whatever the circumstances He's pursuing the one who's pursued him. And a third and final way, I believe we conduct ourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel, whatever happens, is this. Whatever happens, we look to Jesus for our provision. That's Philippians chapter 4. Paul picks up Philippians 4 and verse 11. He says to the Philippians, I'm not saying this because I'm in need, for I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need and I know what it is to have plenty. I've learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all this through him who gives me strength. Did you notice he says there's a secret to being content? It has to be a secret. You know why? Because there are plenty of people who have plenty and they're still not content. There must be a secret. You see, contentment has little to do with how much you have. Paul says there's a secret to being content, whether he had plenty or he was in want. The secret to contentment was found through Christ. Contentment has more to do with the provision of Christ within us than the arrangement of circumstances around us. Contentment has more to do with the provision of Christ within us than the arrangement of circumstances around us. You say, but Chris, what about our basic needs? Oh, he's in the business of fulfilling that too. In fact, Paul closes by saying in Philippians 4 and verse 19, and my God will meet all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. God is in the business of working circumstantially in our life to meet our needs. Thanks be to God. But he's also in the business of giving us the capacity to be content in the midst of our needs. May God be praised. And any time we talk about our needs, we would be remiss if we didn't acknowledge how he has met the greatest of our needs in Christ Jesus. And the greatest of our needs is the need to be forgiven, to know that we're forgiven, to know that life can be redeemed and that each and every one of us can have a new beginning. And so as we turn our hearts uh, toward a time of reflection in communion, and you can be going ahead and getting your emblems ready for communion, I, I want to just make sure that every single one of us has an opportunity to direct the attention of our heart and of our mind to Jesus. Now, for those who've been walking with Jesus for a long time, these next few moments may be just a time for you to consider what the Holy Spirit is saying to you through the Word today. But it could be that there are are others joining us. who It's been a long time since you've had a conversation with Jesus. Or maybe you've never really placed your trust and your faith in Jesus. You don't even know how to begin, but you want to take a step. I want to help you do that. As we move into communion, and even if you don't have emblems with you, 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 you don't know much about what we're doing now. You've just been invited to join us. You can do this just right where you are between you and the Lord, however you may be listening or watching right now, I want to invite you to pray with me as we go into communion. I want to invite you to say the lines of the prayer after me. There's no magic words to this prayer. It's just a way to help you get the conversation started as you place your faith and trust in Him. And if you're doing this for the very first time or for the very first time in a long time, I want to invite you during communion, after you pray this prayer, if you just text the word trust to the number that you'll see on the screen here in just a moment, and we will respond to you. We want to reach out to you and help you make your next step with Jesus.
Just text the word trust if you're doing this for the first time ever or for the first time in a very long time. If you have a prayer request, you can text the word prayer to that same number. We'll follow up with you as well. But for now, will you just take a moment and let's bow our heads as we head into communion. As we reflect on what the Lord is doing at this moment, I want to invite you to pray with me. You can just repeat after me. Lord Jesus, I turn the attention of my heart toward you. You've humbled yourself unto death on a cross for me. Today, I make the words of Paul from Philippians 2 my words. God has exalted you to the highest place. He's given you the name that is above every name. That at your name, the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. This is my confession, Lord. Christ. Amen.